You're listening to a resource from Jamboree Anglican Church. Um, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 7. So if you could open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. In this, does this have the same page numbers as their pew Bibles? No. Uh, Is it on the screen? Okay. And I'm reading from... Verse 36 to 50. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. Okay. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited Jesus, uh, invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, cancelling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the first time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown... We, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let me pray and then we'll look at this passage together. Father, we're grateful that you are a God who speaks to us, makes known the way of salvation clearly, enable us this evening to receive your word, help me to teach faithfully and clearly, and we beg that you would stir within us that love for Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During uh, the 60s, there was a pretty good film made called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Has anyone seen that? Maybe, by the way, yeah, a few of us who are old enough. Uh, 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 For those of you who didn't get to see it, it was about a white upper-class parents who are rather excited about meeting their daughter's fiancé. They've heard a lot of good things about him, that he's a doctor, that he's successful. So it's looking to be a very good dinner party, except they get a rather rude shock the moment the knock on the door is, uh, the door's opened and they discover that he is black. Suddenly, things have changed. The excitement vanishes... And the rest of the movie shows the shock and confusion that the parents have. Remember, this is before Black Lives Matter, uh, when segregation was still common 
and intermarriage, uh, interracial marriage was very rare indeed. Now, at this stage in Jesus' story, um, he's generated a lot of excitement so far in Luke's gospel. Uh, Some have even been surprised and greatly shocked and even confusion reigns among some because he's done some really impressive miracles, but then he says and does some really unexpected things as well. Lots of people are starting to say he's a prophet. Others are saying he's a holy man. Others are saying he's more like, um, uh, he's not so much like the prophet. Maybe he's even more than the prophet. He's the Messiah, in fact. That is God's long promised king who would rule the world forever. But it's very hard to pigeonhole Jesus because he keeps shocking and surprising and confusing all of those categories. In our passage, Simon. A Pharisee, that is a very strict religious Jew, he wants to check Jesus out for himself so that he can make up his own mind about Jesus. So he invites him over to a dinner party so he can suss him out a little bit more. But there's a surprise in the story, an unexpected gatecrasher who shows up. But what's even more surprising, it seems, in the story is Jesus' reaction to the great gatecrasher and the lesson that he teaches uh, from it. We're told that Jesus has come along to the dinner party and that he's reclining at table during the meal, which means that, as was the norm back in those days, he would have been leaning on his left elbow on the floor with his legs extended out behind him. That was the norm, so that you would eat your food and pick at the dinner with your right hand, but you're on the floor. Um... All eyes, though, suddenly turn to this gatecrasher, a woman who lives in the city, described rather blatantly there in um, verses 37 and 39 as a sinner, an immoral woman, more than likely a prostitute. And everyone seems to know that she is. But the woman is beyond shame. You've got to tell me to use this clicker thing, yeah? Uh... Yeah, she's beyond uh, shame. Um, I think that, yeah, there we go. Next one. <laughs> uh, she's beyond shame. She, she just barges in during the, the dinner uh, of the, the house of a very strict uh, religious Jew who's entertaining someone who most people, lots of people, are at least calling a, a very holy man. And yet, here she is. Uh, She could have actually, when you think about it, she could have waited for a more inconspicuous time when Jesus was alone or, or with his disciples. But she obviously just couldn't wait and didn't care. But it's what she does next that really seems to shock everyone. In uh, verse 38 there, have a look at verse 38 with me, please. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Her actions are hardly calculated. Uh, You don't manufacture this kind of display. She's probably come to anoint Jesus' head with her best bottle of uh, Chanel No. 5 perfume. And she just becomes a bumbling mess at the feet of Jesus. And one thing leads uh, to, to the next. Uh, as she puts this very humbling, groveling display on for everyone to see. And my guess is that if you were a guest at that dinner party, you would have been kind of embarrassed and squirming in your seat as you eyeballed this scene working itself out before you. And despite Jesus' reputation as a holy man, she doesn't seem to be worried about rejection either. She's not fearful of Jesus kicking her away. She seems to know something about Jesus, and we'll come to that in a bit. Now, for Simon, 
This has helped him to work out his conclusion about Jesus. Simon is more surprised by Jesus than by what the woman is doing. He's surprised that Jesus is accepting and not rejecting what the woman is doing for him. So Simon doubts Jesus' credentials. Have a look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of a a woman is touching him. She's a sinner. She's a sinner. Now, Simon is actually right about the woman. Luke agrees with him in verse 37. She's a sinner. And even Jesus agrees with him uh, later on. But he's wrong about Jesus on two counts, at least. He thinks that a prophet should be able to know a notorious sinner when he sees one. And secondly, that any prophet would have kicked the woman away. Clearly, Jesus is no prophet because he does neither. But Simon's got Jesus all wrong. And Simon has got God all wrong as well. And Simon's religion is to blame. Like I said, the Pharisees took their religion very, very seriously. Simon thinks that because God hates sin, he also therefore simply hates all sinners. And he thinks that God holds out a big stick for sinners, ready to punish them for all their sins, or in the very least to push them away because God does not accept sin nor sinners. He rather gives sinners what their sins deserve. That's the kind of God that Simon thinks. And therefore, the bigger the sinner, the bigger the repulsion that God would have for that person. And if Jesus were God's man, then he would have given the prostitute a kick in the teeth rather than accept her weeping and pouring perfume on his at his feet. But Simon is wrong about God and he's wrong about Jesus. And it goes to show, friends, that you can be very religious like Simon here, very devout yourself, following your religion to the nth degree but get God totally wrong. You can think you're close to God, but in reality you're a million miles away. Well, up until this point, (laughs) up until this point there's been nothing said. Uh, Simon has only been inwardly thinking his thoughts. But suddenly Jesus speaks up and he points out that he knows that the woman is a sinner through his speech but also that he knows what Simon himself is thinking. He is more of a prophet than Simon realises. But Jesus isn't trying to show off in what he says. He wants Simon and us to learn a really important lesson to correct our thinking about God and about the way that his kingdom operates. So he tells a parable in verses 41 to 42. So have a look at verse 41. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, cancelling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Now, if one piece of silver is what people got for a day's wage, I think you can work out that what we're talking about is large sums of money for both people. Um, There's a lot owed to this money lender. But it's clear that one owes him 10 times the amount of the other. Okay, 50 compared to 500. What's the point of the parable? Well, we need to bear in mind that what Jesus goes on to talk about in verses 44 to 47. Jesus goes on to compare Simon to the woman and then he forgives her sins. So it should be very clear that there's a connection here between forgiving debt in the parable and the forgiveness of sins that Jesus goes on to give to the woman. Jesus is making it clear to Simon that he knows that the woman is a sinner. More than that, that she's probably ten times the sinner that Simon is. But there are three things that Simon and all of us have to understand. 
The first point is that it doesn't matter how big a sinner you are. What matters is whether you're a sinner at all. In the story, both owe a debt that they cannot repay. Uh, Simon, may be, uh, Simon may be able to comfort himself in the fact that he's less of a sinner than most people are, and clearly he's less of a sinner than this woman in particular is. He sins less than most people. But he still has a problem that he is a sinner, that he owes a debt to God, a debt that he cannot repay. Now, if you've got a mortgage on your house, then it doesn't really matter if you owe 500000 or $5 million. If you can't repay it, your house is history. Comparing yourself to someone who owes $5 million when you only owe 500000 is not going to help you out at all. You can't, it won't work. Come judgment day... And each one of us will have to do business with God. And the question that each of us has to answer is, can you pay up? Comparing yourselves to others at that point is not going to cut it with God. Averages will not help either. You see, that's the thing about religion, isn't it? It's all about your performance, how good or how bad you are. So what do you end up doing? Well, in order to work out how well I am, I end up comparing myself to other people. And I try to work out, well, I imagine that if I'm just slightly above average, or if I can get way above average, even better, but if I'm slightly above average, then I've got a better crack come judgment day than anyone else that's below me will have. And most people think that the pass mark, therefore, is above average. So if you think you're better than most, then you can easily be lulled into a false sense of security. But God does not judge on averages. There are no standard deviations uh, when it comes to the judgment of God. Sorry if you've done your HSC recently and that's kind of bringing back memories for you. Uh, But there's nothing like that. There's no bell curve and God doesn't kind of work out where the... The average is, or anything like that. The question is, and the Bible keeps on making the point again and again, are you a sinner? In other words, you have to ace the exam. No sin at all. Because if you're a sinner before God, there will be hell to pay. The Bible makes it very clear. God wants all of us to know ahead of time, in fact, come judgment day, that we're all in for a rude shock. None of us are going to be able to pay up. The Bible says very clearly, Romans 3.23, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one, and therefore no one will be saved before God based on what they've done. Now, Simon is too busy comparing himself to others, like the woman, to realise that even though his debt is way smaller, it's still way too big for him to repay to God. Now, that's not the case with the woman. She's not comparing herself to anyone. She knows that she's the bottom of the barrel. No doubt everyone on the street would have told her as such. She's not looking to anyone else for her It's just Jesus that she's looking to at this point. The second point is that because we can't pay up, what we need is grace. We need grace. We need forgiveness. Now We've lost those points in the the sermon outline. Not sure why. But anyway, if you can put those in. Um, We're all sinners. We need grace. (laughs) Uh, Uh, We need forgiveness. In verse 42, the original word actually for forgiving the debt in the original is the word for grace. The moneylender was gracious with them. That word grace, I think, has to be the most wonderful word in the Christian dictionary. It means to give or forgive when people don't deserve it. To give or forgive... When people don't deserve it. Giving when people do deserve it, well, that's just getting what you earned. But giving or forgiving when people don't deserve it, that is grace. That's generosity. That's pure gifts. Nothing earned. 
Sinners need grace. And here's the point. Whether you're the biggest sinner or whether you're the littlest sinner, you need grace. You need grace. So what if you need it more than others? What matters is whether you need it at all. And God tells us, in case we can't figure it out for ourselves, that we all need grace because we are all sinners. And the good news of the Bible is that God is a God who is rich in grace and mercy. That's the way he's often described. It's a wonderful description of him. I mean, he's loaded with cash. But best of all, he's loaded with mercy and grace. I prefer the second in my current state than the first. God is gracious with sinners. He doesn't give them what they deserve, but he forgives them. One of the first memory verses I ever learned was Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not by works. This is the surprising thing about God, I think. Most people expect God to not permit good... uh, Sorry, I should say, to only permit good people into heaven and to put all bad people into hell. All sinners go to hell. But that is not the case at all. God is a God who wants to let sinners into heaven. He wants to forgive sins. That's what he desires to do. That's what he's motivated to do. And people don't expect to find a God like that. You see, the, the surprising twist in, um, in, in the, the story that Jesus tells is that the money lender, just try to grapple with that. The money lender. Most of us, I think, have some inclination of what money lenders are like. But it's the money lender who cancels their debt. That is, we're not ever thinking that money lenders are gracious. <laughs> That's not the way that we think about money lenders. They can't afford to be. They don't cancel debts, they make sure that people pay up or else. That's the way they are. If anything, what we associate with moneylenders is stingy, mean people who try to take more than they give. That's the nature of a moneylender. They're not interested in people. They're just interested in money and making more of it. Now, sadly, that's also the image that a lot of people have about God, as we discover. If you press what they're thinking to the nth degree, that's exactly the picture that they have about God. And that's probably the greatest travesty of religious thinking. But God is no mean, stingy money lender. He may hate sin, But he, in fact, loves sinners. He is a God of grace. He is more than willing to forgive sinners all their sin, no matter how great they are. They don't have to pay a cent. It's completely free. That's the kind of God that we discover in the pages of the Bible. And that's particularly the kind of God that we discover hanging on a cross. The third point is the question that Jesus asked Simon in verse 42. Which of them will love him more, he says. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon grudgingly answers uh, what he knows to be the logical answer. Well, I suppose, I guess, the one who had the greater debt cancelled. That's got to be the person who loves him more. And he finally gets something right. And the point is very simple. Those who've been forgiven much will love much. And then in verse 44 to 47, Jesus shows how this has played out between Simon and the woman who is weeping at his feet and kissing her. Uh, Particularly the way that they they both treated Jesus. Verse uh, 44. Let's read it. Look at the woman kneeling the ear. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. What a contrast. 
And then it goes on, I tell you her sins, they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the best way to sum up the difference between the two is duty and devotion. It's the difference between duty on the one hand and devotion on the other hand. Common courtesy or utter devotion. I'll change that to common uh, uh, to duty rather than uh, courtesy versus uh, utter devotion. No? Yeah. Um, the, the social convention of the time meant that Simon had a duty to look after his guests. In the minimum, that would have been to greet them and welcome them into his home. And usually that would mean offering a, a kiss. Yes, men still greet each other with a kiss in the Middle East. Um, I still greet most of my cousins that way. Um, I'm from the Middle East. That's what we do. Um, nothing unusual there. Uh, and then, um, as the convention of the time was, uh, you would offer them water to wash their feet and a towel so that they can dry uh, their feet. Now, if you really wanted to honour your guests, then what you would do is pour oil over their heads. Don't ask me why, but that makes, their, makes your hair more lustrous and... Um, I guess uh, better smelling than, you know, not washed hair. Uh, That's the way it goes. Now, Simon, we're told, does the very minimum of welcoming Jesus into his home. He doesn't even follow the social convention. No kiss, no water for his feet, no oil for his head. I guess Simon would argue about this that I don't have to follow social convention. There is no law dictating that I follow social convention. It's just a convention. It's not my obligation. So clearly, Simon has very little regard for Jesus from the start. But the woman didn't know, or more likely probably didn't care anything about convention or decorum or duty. She, She is just throwing that kind of idea way out the window and she is just a bumbling mess at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because it's just utter devotion. She's washing Jesus' feet with her tears, wiping them with... She's not stopped kissing his... I mean, people don't do that kind of a thing on a regular basis. I've never seen anyone do that. Have you? And if I did see it, I'd be... I'd be kind of just squirming. It's unusual. But I don't think you can describe it in any other way than as utter devotion. Utter devotion. And now we see why the woman has acted in this way as she did. She was led by love unbridled love for the one who loved her and had forgiven her her many, many sins. And I think it's very clear from what Jesus says to the woman in verse 48, your sins are forgiven, that it's meant to be a reaffirmation of something that he's already told her earlier. And he's just wanting to reassure her again. But secondly, to make it very clear to the rest of the people there, that her sins are forgiven and that he has the authority as the Son of Man to forgive sins uh, to whomever he wants. If only now she was being forgiven after her act of love, then everything that Jesus said doesn't make sense. So you've got to read it that way. Now the woman had her many, many sins forgiven by Jesus and that's why she, well the best word I can use is worship. That's why she's worshipping at his feet. She wasn't commanded to do it. Convention didn't dictate this to her. She is just overwhelmed with thanks, with love and devotion to Jesus. And Jesus receives it from her gladly, not because this is what is expected of her, but because he, he can see the love being poured out from her as she's doing it. Jesus is basically saying to Simon, what you are seeing is the evidence 
of forgiven sins. This is the powerful effects of grace. She is loving Jesus because her many sins have been forgiven by him. You see, friends, here is the difference between religion and true Christianity, between how religion views God and how God truly is in the Bible and the difference it can make to your life. Religion, like Simon, sees God as a strict God of law who threatens sinners with a stick when they step out of line and who rewards good behaviour. And that's the way that he manipulates people into doing the right thing. Very much like karma. You get what you deserve. Fear will stop you from doing the wrong thing and self-interest will encourage you to, to do the right thing. Now, it's not really about relating to God, is it? But much more about making sure that you get the right things from God. It's all about what you do, no matter about your heart, your motivations for what you do or why you do it. It's just what you do. And even though most Aussies aren't religious, I think they think of God like this, as religion does. But Christians, like this woman, see God as the God who is rich in grace, who welcomes sinners and is willing to forgive them no matter how, how much they have done wrong and how great their sins are and who have experienced this wonderful forgiveness that Jesus offers them. And this has a powerful effect on us. It fills our hearts with gratitude and love for Jesus. Christians are not driven by, what do I have to do to avoid being sent to hell or being in God's bad books? And what do I have to do in order to get into heaven? No, they're driven by thankfulness and love for what Jesus has done for us already. And they do works out of utter devotion to Jesus for showing the grace, for forgiving them their sins and giving them entry into heaven already despite the fact that they don't deserve it. Christianity is all about having a loving relationship with God where you are utterly devoted to him because Jesus is utterly devoted to you. Now, the surprising thing to most people is that grace yields good works that God desires in people Far more than religion ever can, no matter how strict or severe religion may be. Now, I say this because this is the story that I usually tell Muslims, or and sometimes I tell others who, from a traditional religious background, from a, a, a traditional uh, Christian uh, background, when they object that the teaching about grace, that we can be saved by grace alone, that we are forgiven on the basis of having done nothing to deserve it. People think that that will cause people to therefore just go and live, or you may as well do whatever you want because Jesus will just forgive you in the end anyway. I can't tell you the amount of Muslims who have said to me, that is the problem with grace. That's the problem with your doctrine of grace. Now, rather than argue it out logically... The best way that I've found uh, to make the point very clear about the powerful effects of grace is to show them and tell them this story. And I tell out the story and I say to them, you see, that's true Christianity. Grace has a powerfully transforming effect. The forgiveness of sins and grace makes a huge difference in the Christian's heart. It changes our hearts. It's a massive difference between grace-empowered Christianity and works-based Christianity. Massive difference. And that's what most of the New Testament is written to show why grace matters and it's not law. Religion forces you to toe the line. You have to perform or else, but your heart is not necessarily in it. And too often what we see, well, is there is no real love in the heart. For most, it's heartless, minimalist duty. That's what religion boils down to. I don't involve my heart. Secondly, I try to work out what little or the least that I need to do, and then I do it. But grace 
transforms the heart. Christians don't have to please God like religious people have to do good works in order to get into heaven. No, Christians want to please God because they want to thank him and love him because he's graciously given them heaven despite their poor performance. I hope you can see the massive difference between Christianity on one side, true biblical Christianity, and religion on the other hand. Christians do it because they love Jesus. Grace has that powerfully transforming effect on their hearts so that it fills it with thankfulness and love for Jesus. And why wouldn't they? Because they've seen how much he has loved them as he sacrificed himself on the cross. He died so that they can be forgiven. So friends, I want to finish by asking (laughs) how deep is your love? I mean, do you love Jesus? How much do you love Jesus? How deep is your love? Now, I recognise at this point there is a tendency amongst us to feel guilty about all this, that we don't love Jesus enough. If you're, a, if you're like me, then you kind of read the story and you feel a little bit of a rebuke. Um, uh, and what we look for is some encouragement, something to do uh, so that we can live for Jesus more and do more good works and, and show our love for him. But the truth is, I think... Most of us, if not all of us, would be thinking that I need to love Jesus more. I don't love him enough. Now, I don't think the solution is for me to get you to do more good works and to ask the question, what is it that you have to do? I don't want to finish, therefore, by encouraging you to do good works and live for Jesus, believe it or not. And the solution is clearly not to compare ourselves to anybody else. Even this woman at this point, you say, oh, I've never done that for Jesus. No. I think the key solution is to focus on how much we have been forgiven. And I'm not suggesting what you do is you look at all the things that you've done wrong all your life. No. I think the key here is to look to Jesus and the massive cost he had to bear in order to secure the forgiveness for your sins. And realise just how much he had to do to get you personally off the hook. Going to hell. Look to the cross. Because it cost Jesus the same to forgive you as it did even the most notorious of sinners, like this woman or whoever else comes to your mind. Look to the cross. John Newton was a notorious sinner, a slave trader, a gambler, a murderer. He knew he was a sinner, but when he had been forgiven much, he loved much. He threw himself into serving Jesus with a passion. And he wrote that wonderfully popular favourite hymn, probably of all time, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch a wretch like me. That is, Christians see themselves as wretches before God. And all the more when they see Jesus hanging on the cross and they recognise that he is hanging there because of their sins. And that is why they deeply, madly love him. Because he deeply, madly loved them. Let's pray. Now, Father, we pray that you would so fill us with a vision of Jesus hanging on the cross for our sins so that we can see how much it cost him to secure our forgiveness. And may that work by the power of your spirit, such thankfulness and love in our hearts that we give ourselves in utter devotion to him so that we might do anything to please him, not caring about anybody else and what they think of us or of him. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from Jembrew Anglican Church. For more information, head to jembrewanglican.com.